In the propaganda of the victors, the Second World War was a war against fascism. The nationalist dictators of Europe were singled out as special targets for retribution. In Italy, Mussolini's body was displayed hanging upside down from a lamppost in Milan. Himmler, the leader of the Nazi SS, killed himself and his corpse was put on show for the world's newsreels. But there was one man who survived from this era, although for many years he carried the stigma of being Hitler's friend. He was called the Cordillo, or leader of Spain. Francisco Franco. Forty years from 1936 to his death in 1975, Franco dominated Spain. By the end of his life, younger Spaniards could hardly believe what lay behind this fossilized image of power. In the fighting in Spanish Morocco in the early part of the century, Franco had made a name for himself as an energetic and courageous officer. He was never backward in urging his own promotion, and he was soon given command of the Spanish Foreign Legion, going on to become, at 33, Spain's youngest general. He was a favorite of those in high places, including the king, but he was different from other officers. Franco was totally against the Spanish stereotype. He was cold, laconic, and it was perhaps his almost foreign quality that was one of the things that allowed him to hold on so long. They never could figure him out, so they couldn't figure out a way to get him out. By the time I was assigned to Spain, Franco had pretty well outlived himself, and he was not that interested in meeting foreigners, especially foreign journalists. But I remember one time he received us all standing on a platform and shaking hands down at us with that famous blank stare of his like an iguana's. Uh, as if he knew something about each of us, but wasn't saying. His Spaniards found him that way. He was as unfathomable to them as a chicken farmer is to his chickens. Spain had been unsettled since the beginning of the 19th century. As Franco worked his way upwards, Spanish politics became increasingly turbulent. A brief military dictatorship failed. In 1931, to avoid civil war, King Alfonso went into exile or he died 10 years later. With the establishment of a republic, disorders grew worse. There were, it seemed, two Spains, one ferociously traditionalist, the other agitating equally ferociously for social change. Each side became determined not merely to defeat the other, but to exterminate it. Moderates at the head of the Republic were undermined by extremists on both sides and by the thickening climate of violence. Churches were burned, priests murdered, workers, liberals, leftists were shot down. Franco was Spain's most prestigious military figure, but the government was uncertain of his loyalty and he was sent to the Canary Islands. 
By 1936, the country was drifting towards anarchy. In July, a leading supporter of the monarchy, Calvo Sotelo, was murdered by special police agents in uniform. With the machinery for a military takeover already in being, the generals decided to strike. Though he came late to the conspiracy, Franco's early moves were decisive. Using planes provided by Mussolini, he ferried troops across to Spain from Morocco, where he'd taken command. At the outset, the nationalists won control of the south, the west, and the north. Franco's immediate aim was to build up his strength in the south before moving to link up with other nationalist forces. He was not committed to any of the competing right-wing ideologies in Spain, but his military reputation automatically gave him a leading position in the nationalist movement. Franco was a kind of a young hornet surrounded by aging bumblebees. Most of them were monarchist bumblebees. A few of them were phalangists, were extremely anti-monarchical, and Franco was in the middle of them, never quite revealing what he was. The phalangist generals thought he was a phalangist, the monarchists thought he was a monarchist, and he managed to keep them all together and never show his hand. A month after his arrival in Seville, Franco hoisted the nationalist flag. It was to be the red and gold of traditional Spain. On the Republican side, the outbreak of civil war immediately precipitated the very revolution which the generals had most feared. Workers in the powerful communists and labor unions clamored for arms themselves, which soon led to the rule of armed mobs in Madrid, Barcelona, and other big cities within the Republican camp. Stalin ordered some of the most experienced leaders of the international communist movement to take over the direction of this revolution within Republican Spain. He hoped to turn Spain into the first Soviet satellite state. The Republican government was virtually cut off from assistance from the Western democracies and so came to rely increasingly on aid from the Soviet Union. In the long run, the organizational skills of the communists and their insistence on party discipline told over the early wild enthusiasm of the armed bands of workers. Franco's initial success brought him quickly within reach of the capital, Madrid. But he turned first to relieve a nationalist force which was holding out in appalling conditions in the old Alcazar and Toledo. The relief of the Alcazar in Toledo was not of major strategic or even tactical significance. However, what made it important was its symbolic value. You had here an instance of nationalist forces bottled up in this castle, fighting heroically and going through the tortures of the dam. And it made a kind of a moral symbol, which the Franco forces, let it be said, badly needed at this point. And it was a symbol that was to carry them through the war and to go on for years and years afterwards. Franco was only one of several prominent generals at the start of the war, but within three months, he was named to supreme command and, as it turned out, to even higher things. There was no doubt that Franco was the main figure among the nationalist generals. It was not clear, however, what the future form of government would be. And so while his supporters were willing to see him assume the political leadership, they were not ready to have the future form of Spain declared. But when the decree appointing him head of government went to the printers, it came out with an alteration proclaiming him head of state. It seemed like such a small thing at the time, and yet he had in fact replaced the monarchy by the stroke of a pen. Franco was 43. He called himself Cordillo, the leader, in imitation of the dictators of Germany and Italy, the Führer and the Duce, on whom he depended for military support.
almost from the outset the civil war had become internationalized hitler used spain as a training ground for his own forces his pilots gained experience in the aerial bombardment of undefended cities the death toll in the civil war was horrifying some say as high as half a million apart from those killed in the fighting many thousands were massacred by both sides behind the lines there's no reason to think that Franco was in the least bit sadistic. He was a perfectly rational man. He did remarkably little to stop atrocities. Uh, he did not have a, a Hitler-type solution to kill people actively. But he did believe that those guilty on the other side should be wiped out. And he was not averse to seeing his political opposition disappear one way or the other. The element of fratricidal combat makes every death a kind of murder. A hundred year old grudges were being paid and it was probably the particular personal grudge killings that were one of the main elements of the atrocities in this war. There's no doubt that the Civil War produced a great spiritual upheaval outside of Spain. You had people in England and France and America and everywhere flocking to join in, feeling that for once the issue of democracy and totalitarianism could be fought out and everyone was free to join. There were even some idealists who joined it on the other side, feeling that this was the battle against the evil of communism. Franco was not a dictator in the Nazi or fascist manner, but he was determined to use power to purge Spain of those elements which, from the nationalist point of view, had contributed to the present troubles. After the relief of Toledo, the civil war turned into a brutal war of attrition. And it was not until March 1939 that Franco was able to move to the capture of a starving Madrid. In Franco's siege and eventual conquest of Madrid, he used to say that while he had four military columns aimed at the city, he had a fifth column inside it, made up of the hundreds and thousands of people who, although they lived under the Republicans, were strong nationalist sympathizers. And this, indeed, is the origin of the famous phrase, fifth column. At last, the war was over. In May, Franco held an impressive victory parade in the capital. What he was doing was establishing that this was not only a military victory, but that the character of Spain, as he saw it, was now firmly established, and that what he called the anti-Spain, the liberal, Masonic, communist conspiracy, as he called it, would never have a foothold in Spain again. Although public opinion in the Western democracies was strongly against him, Franco's government won diplomatic recognition from all but the Soviet Union and Mexico. As the larger war in Europe approached, both sides applied pressure on Franco. The Axis powers naturally expected him to join them. Britain and France urged him to keep out. Outwardly, Franco seemed to be at one with the Axis powers. And in March 39, he signed a treaty of friendship with Hitler's Germany, though it did not commit Spain to military action. Despite the inflated ego of Mussolini, the Italians appealed more to Franco. At least they were Latins and Catholics. And by the end of the Civil War, 50,000 of them had fought in Spain. The outbreak of World War put Franco in a difficult position. Spain needed peace and time to recover, and neither seemed likely to be granted her. The diplomacy of war would tax to the limit Franco's resources of cunning, duplicity, and caution. In October 1940, with France defeated and all Europe apparently at his feet, Hitler came to the Spanish frontier for a meeting which he hoped would bring Spain into the war on Germany's side. Franco's train was an hour late, deliberately so, some say, so that for all the disparity in the actual power they disposed of, Franco succeeded from the start in upstaging the Nazi leader. 
It was the first and only time they met. Hitler's meeting with Franco was so exasperating to the German. Hitler was talking about the grand schemes and Franco was noodling along about the condition of his paved roads and the supply of corn to his chickens. And Franco's nitpicking tactics and lengthy, lengthy talk in his high-pitched voice proved so irritating to Hitler that after the meeting he told one of his associates that he would rather have every single one of his teeth pulled rather than meet with Franco again. Hitler wanted a free run to Gibraltar, the British base which controlled the entrance to the Western Mediterranean. But Franco stubbornly refused to oblige to the increasing frustration and anger of the Germans. Hitler's invasion of Russia, however, enabled Franco to offer volunteers to fight on the Russian front. 18,000 Spanish regulars being formed in what was known as the Blue Division. Later, as the war turned against Germany and British pressure on Franco mounted, the Blue Division was withdrawn. It was universally assumed that he was on the side of Hitler and Mussolini. Hitler and Mussolini certainly assumed so, and he kept promising to come in. But somehow he kept delaying and delaying and delaying, and eventually his connections with the Axis weakened as the Axis armies began being defeated. Though Franco would have liked to take possession of Gibraltar, the risks were too great. His neutrality, in fact, served the Western Allies well. Throughout the war, he provided them with vital raw materials and an important weather service. Spanish representatives were always well received by the British in Gibraltar. Churchill appreciated Franco's position, but when the war finally came to an end, public opinion in the West denounced Franco's survival. For too long, he had been identified in the popular press as a war criminal, hardly different from those being tried at Nuremberg. In France, the aged Marshal Pétain was condemned to death for his part in collaborating with the Germans after France's collapse in June 1940. Why should Franco be allowed to get away with it? In December 1946, the United Nations formally ostracized Franco's government. Mass demonstrations in support of Franco took place in Spain's largest cities. But the Spanish people wanted no more foreign interference in their affairs. Though reconstruction might take a long time, Franco would go it alone, grateful for every crumb of support. He found this support in Argentina, where Perón had come to power. Under the sign of a kind of a Hispanic unity, Argentina furnished Spain with some badly needed food, mainly wheat, as well as with the visit of Evita Perón, who came to Madrid and was received cordially by Franco and his officials and somewhat less cordially by their wives. In the end, it was the Cold War which came to Franco's rescue. With NATO being formed with a Mediterranean naval strategy, the geographical position of Spain was essential to Western military planners. And in the early 50s, American military representatives began visiting Spain. And although Spain never formally joined NATO, she did conclude an informal alliance and a formal military agreement with the United States, which brought her military supplies trade, respectability, and finally, the triumphal visit of President Eisenhower. So Franco survived to make what he could of Spain. Franco became famous for his dams. The notion of bringing water to a dry land was the kind of concrete vision that somebody of a relatively narrow political imagination could go for. And somehow, every couple of months on the official Spanish newsreel, Spaniards would see Franco in one more gaunt piece of hill country, dedicating one more dam. 
In each phase of his long life, Franco had been single-minded in his pursuit of power. Even his extreme old age was turned into a kind of power. Spain had clearly outgrown him, but by then, he was too old to overthrow. Although Franco left his intentions for the future very much in the dark, most people felt that he would appoint some kind of royal successor. As it turned out, he named not the official royal heir, Don Juan, but Don Juan's son, Juan Carlos, who had been brought up in Spain under Franco's supervision and seemed to him to be a reliable successor. In his last long years, Franco had achieved total power and was doing remarkably little with it. It was a secret, I think, of his longevity. He fought all his life to gain power and to hold on to it. But he probably realized that using power eventually uses it up. So he would delegate his authority to his ministers, and when they made a botch of it, as sooner or later they would, he dismissed them and got others. It was an irony. For 150 years, Spaniards had been fighting for power as if it were the most precious thing in the world. When Franco got it, he held on to it, and he didn't use it. He made it boring. He demystified it. And by the time he died, the Spaniards found that they didn't need him at all. And perhaps that was his achievement.